You know, our students are in the middle of their uh, prelims now, and uh, I'm sure that, that he's given them uh, some, some uh, equations to review and maybe uh, some faculty uh, questions to ask students. So anyway, our next uh, talk is uh, uh, Dr. Yuprachard, and he is currently the president of Druid Consulting. Um, this is a, uh, a uh, company that he founded um, in 2003 and basically they consult uh, with uh, pharmaceutical and biotech firms on uh, different ways to run and manage and, and develop uh, compounds. He's also, very interestingly, um, a venture partner and senior scientific advisor for uh, Red Abbey uh, Venture Partners, which is a investment uh, firm that supports and, and banks the development of uh, drug discovery and, and, and pharmaceutical uh, discovery research. Um, Dr. Yipichard uh, received his BS in pharmacology at the University of Glasgow and an MS and PhD in pharmacology at the University of Can Kansas and was a tenured associate professor in pharmacology, neurobiology, and physiology at uh, Northwestern University. Um, between the years of 1986 and 1997, he worked at ICI Zeneca as the, and uh, eventually rose to the ranks of an executive vice president and international director of research with that company. In uh, the late 90s, uh, he moved uh, to Smith Klein Beecham and assumed the role of uh, president of research and development at uh, Smith Klein Beecham. Uh, his talk today is entitled uh, Biochemical, uh, oh, excuse me, Bioscience Research, Creativity, Innovation, and Value Creation from Academia through Biotech to the Market. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am very delighted to be here at Case Western. Um, it's, it's been a super day, and I have really enjoyed the opportunity to catch up with a few old friends and indeed a former student, Paul Lawrenceberger. Um, I'm, I'm giving a different kind of talk because I haven't generated data for a long time. Uh, so I'm not going to show you much data. I, I do have a little data. It's, it's getting on a bit, not too bad. And I've not been to Stockholm. Actually, I have been there as a tourist, but I haven't shaken hands with the king. <laughs> so um, what I want to do is, is kind of uh, move around a little bit. Um, and I think this might be of interest to the postdocs and the students here as they're thinking of their future careers and specifically whether or not to go into industry, be it pharma or biotech. And indeed, some of, some of the professors here who may be uh, thinking of uh, starting up their own companies. Um, so uh, I've got kind of a couple of general themes uh, that I want to touch on. And really, it's all about you know, what, what are the impulses for creativity and innovation uh, for the discovery and development of new drugs? Uh, where does that impulse and spirit best lie? Academia, small companies, large companies. Uh, all this stuff needs a fair amount of money. Who should be funding it? Um, there is an imbalance that we'll talk a little bit about between the amount of capital, uh, money that's available, and the sheer scale of the opportunity, especially in, I guess, what I still refer to as the post-genomic era. I've become increasingly interested in uh, Asia, specifically India, as a, a source of uh, really exponentially quality increasing uh, science that is still uh, relatively inexpensive. And these guys and the Chinese and other East and South Asians are just moving ahead very, very rapidly. Um, and we need to think very seriously about that. So, um, this isn't meant to be self-serving. Uh, I just want to give you a flavor of the different kinds of things that I've done. In a nutshell, I've gone from uh, science to business to, uh, in fact, money. Um, that's either the road to heaven or the road to perdition. But the aim has been really focused around uh, the, the service of the discovery of better medicines. I started out as... Uh, very old-fashioned pharmacologist, uh, which I guess I stayed. I was trained in the, uh, 
uh, kind of classical British and European schools of uh, physiological pharmacology. Um, as a young student at the University of Glasgow, I, I uh, certainly hung up every uh, piece of contractile tissue that you could possibly think of. And I uh, smoked my own drums. Uh, the older people among you can actually translate that for the youngers, <laughs> younger folks, and, and uh, indeed varnish them so that we kept the traces. Um, and I was particularly interested in uh, uh, why contractile tissue contracted and the mathematics of these contractions. And uh, it all kind of boiled down to receptors, but you have to remember in the late 1960s, receptors were still a theoretical con concept. And uh, I, I sat at the feet of the good Dr. Stevenson at the University of Edinburgh, Clark Stevenson and Arians, for those of you who may remember that paper, uh, to, to learn receptor theory when there were no receptors. Um, and indeed from the, uh, and that was in the context of, of looking at uh, you know, the binding of uh, uh, ligands, whether they be neurotransmitters or the drugs that were then available uh, to tissue and what they did. On the other hand, there were people like Bernard, Bernard Bello in Canada who were theorizing about what receptors might look like, but basically uh, on, on the basis of kind of pharmacophoric models. So there were no crystal structures out there, or very, very few for anything at all. In the same era, uh, spending a little time at the University College London, I was extremely grateful and fortunate to uh, get taught and have lab experience with the likes of you know, Professor um, in fact, Heinz Sauter Schilt, H.O. Schilt of the Schilt plot. Hopefully some of you at least have heard of the Schilt plot. And, and Professor Bernard Katz, who won the Nobel Prize in 1972 for kind of definitively uh, illustrating uh, synaptic transmission at the acetylcholine neuroeffector junction. So um, this, in, in a nutshell, uh, without going through it, is the kind of uh, zigzag progression of my career. And most of that career has been uh, with a couple of large pharmaceutical compa companies, okay, uh, ICI that became Zeneca and, and Smith, Klein, Beecham. And, uh, those of you who uh, may have followed the fortunes of uh, pharmaceutical companies in recent years or even be thinking of going to work for them because they've got a lot of money and they've got a lot of fancy equipment and they can afford in, 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 in Vitrogen's uh, uh, supplies. Um, <laughs> let's just talk a little bit about the, the, the issues that the large pharmaceutical industry has. And, and I may say, by the way, uh, I will come back to my kind of receptor interests uh, as I talk uh, for a few minutes later on about my experiences running a small biotech company, 3D Pharmaceuticals. Um, but just one other particular element of my own personal history from this kind of theoretical but very absorbing interest over in the UK and uh, these sort of mythic mythical things that were called receptors. Um, I ultimately, in the mid-70s, became very fortunate to go to the laboratory of Dr. Solomon Snyder at, at Johns Hopkins University uh, at a great time when, uh, really for the first time, K-tritium labeled, um, in fact, ligands, either of neurotransmitters or of, or of drugs, uh, were being made with high enough specific radioactivity that they could be used uh, to demonstrate a, song, a strong signal of binding of these small molecules to something, and perhaps these something were actually receptors, as indeed in most instances they turned out to be. So um, that was all very exciting, uh, certainly at that time. Um, a, a rather famous industrial scientist by the name of Jürgen, Jürgen Drevs, uh, who headed R&D at Roche about 10 years ago, started to uh, talk publicly about the, uh, as he referred to, innovation gap. Uh, the disjunction between all the money that went into uh, the basic science and the drug dis discovery process uh, within the pharmaceutical industry and the relative meagerness of the output. Now, um, for the prior 20 years, there had been a kind of 
tug of war between the, if you like, the principle of serendipity. Uh, let's just hire a few of the best and brightest of you, you, you folks. Uh, pay you a, a significant amount of money, more than, than you can get in academia, put you in the back lab, and your native genius will ca enable you to discover a drug that you'll pop over the wall and give to the commercial people and they're gonna make a, an awful lot of money. That's what I mean by the, the kind of classic principle of serendipity within the drug industry. Increasingly through the 1970s and 80s, as a result of the kind of pioneering theoretical receptor work and then practical receptor and then enzymologic work that was being done at that time, uh, the principle of rational design of drugs became more and more into the fore. And uh, second point there, um, as the drug industry became uh, phenomenally profitable and Wall Street uh, felt okay about very significant dollars being reinvested back into research and development, uh, the concept of scale in these drug companies uh, really got bought into, the concept of big science. Uh, can we beat the odds? Can we beat serendipity simply by high throughput everything? Beat it with just in terms of sheer numbers. Friends of mine like Sir James Black, yeah, the discovery of the beta blockers and the H2 blockers in two different companies and still going strong at uh, uh, the J&J College that was set up in London for him. Uh, have consistently over many decades rebelled against uh, that concept from a kind of cost effectiveness point of view. Just scale and battering everything with dollars and numbers isn't the solution. Let's think small and think very, very carefully. And the problem is in today's era, uh, although a large amount of money, and I'll show you some numbers, is spent in drug R&D, it is not infinite. And uh, the folks that really matter, who are the folks in Wall Street and London and Frankfurt, uh, make, make very, very sure that not a penny more is spent on R&D than is actually justified by the business returns of the pharmaceutical industry. So it's a large amount on a worldwide basis, about 80 or so billion, um, probably nowadays, uh, 25% uh, of that goes into what we call the discovery part of R&D, which really is uh, all the preclinical stuff and, and through to phase 2A. $20 billion in discovery research. Sounds like a lot of money, but actually, uh, compared to the, the scale of the opportunity, um, there is a bit of a mismatch. Now, I personally think that that mismatch is, is rather global and rather significant. And, and I refer to it here in this slide as the funding gap in terms of research for new drug development. Whether we're talking about the plateauing or even the decline in absolute dollars of NIH funding, whether we're talking about the steady reduction of that portion of that 80 or so billion spent by the biotech and the pharmaceutical companies on R&D, the smaller and smaller proportion of that actually going to discovery research. Or in the case of the smaller biotech companies, the fact that the people who give them money, the venture capitalists, uh, are increasingly less inclined to support basic research and the, and the upstream part of the enterprise. So there is a global uh, lack or gap of uh, the kind of dollars okay, in pounds and euros and yen that you'd like to see to uh, support what could be done given all the scientific advances over the last decade. So we've talked a little bit, and let me make a few more points about the uh, kind of classical development of the drug R&D industry. 1960s and 70s, mainly reliance on individual scientific insights, people like James Black, Paul Janssen, uh, Cushman at Squibb, the discoverer of the ACE inhibitors. Um, slowly but surely, with the advent of new technologies, structure-based drug design, uh, supported by combinatorial chemistry in the late 80s, um, became the, the, uh, you know, the flavor of the decade, essentially. And then we had the, uh, the, the onslaught of the genomics, okay, data, and a new paradigm for drug discovery. Uh, the largest, most visible impact of that, of course, has been the glut of information that we've had to absorb and try to make sense of and try to get some knowledge out of that information. And that, to me, is still very much a work in progress. 
Many people have put their faith on the large-scale, okay, industrial generation of uh, synthesis and screening of small molecules, high throughput this, high throughput that. As we have um, isolated targets and uh, learn more and more about them, and also as our healthcare and commercial environment has become more and more complicated, we're actually running into some real issues around the economics of validating targets. Now, it depends what you mean by validating a target. To us in the industry, it's not simply um, proving at the preclinical level that its pharmacology might be translatable to some clinical efficacy. It's actually proving that clinical efficacy and that the shape of that clinical efficacy is enough to make some real money at some future point in time when the drug actually gets out onto the market. So if you take that view of target validation, it's a very significant challenge. And uh, it, it, it r requires a lot of cash and it's become a real economic issue. Now, so R&D has become increasingly complex. Uh, the the R&D industry, be it pharma or biotech, has certainly responded to that constructively by uh, developing management and portfolio processes that are increasingly efficient and effective. I'm not going to go into this in detail. These are just facts and data about pressures on the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, the, there's the famous graph that people show in a hundred different ways up here in the top right. The number of new drugs that have been introduced okay, here, here in America has uh, steadily declined at, at, at a slow rate while uh, R&D costs have very significantly escalated. And the other panels uh, illustrate the, the issues that the industry faces in somewhat more detail. What this means, by the way, they, uh, you know, the people on Wall Street aren't stupid either. So uh, the, the value of the pharmaceutical industry has actually declined slowly but steadily over the last decade as uh, the bankers and the investors have realized, you know, it's a slower return rate than what we thought. It's not as profitable as we thought. And that's kind of a vicious circle because that decline in capital value makes it that much more hard for the CEO and the head of R&D of the drug company to actually reinvest in R&D, especially the basic research. It's a very basic figure for people working in the industry, which is that uh, as you progress from uh, through drug development, from the late stages of preclinical through your clinical and out onto the market, you're obviously, with each experiment that you do, if it's successful, you're going to decrease forward risk, but all that costs money. And uh, it costs money, but you're increasing value. So you've got a balance between re reduction of risk and increase in value. And the thing that kept Fred, I'm sure, up late, you know, at night, certainly me, uh, as uh, you know, people actually actually managing significant portfolios of such projects is how can you pinpoint, you know, the balance between risk and value and how can you push your decision making as early as you can in the process? So R&D is a process of sequential investments and experiments to validate if efficacy and safety and thereby reduce financial risk. There is what we call in both pharma and biotech a sweet spot. Again, without going into detail, um, as you move through the phases of early clinical development to prove your clinical efficacy concept, you're actually spending relatively little money uh, for a significant reduction in, in forward risk. And so the, the, uh, the kind of return that you can ma make if you spend relatively little money to increase the value of your data over, over that particular part of the process, uh, you can actually make a larger return. Why is this important? Because there are hundreds and hundreds of small biotech companies who fervently believe in this as their investors do. In other words, let's just you know, set up what we need to set up, take the good ideas out of academia, push it through to phase 2A and find an exit, as they say, and it's all to do with that sweet spot. So I pinched this slide from Peter Kaur of Pfizer, 
And it's really interesting. I'd intuitively thought that, uh, I mean, you, you've, you've all heard the figures, you know, the cost of developing a drug, and this is out of date, is now maybe 1.3 billion, 1.5 billion dollars, but includes cost of failure. And we all know that uh, phase three large-scale clinical trials are easily individually the most expensive part of the R&D proposition. Therefore, presumably, that's where most of the cost of failure is. That ain't true. Most of the failure is actually in the laboratory uh, before the drug gets into man. 90% of the cost of failure occurs in the lab before the drug gets into the clinic. So we pay a lot of attention, whether we're in a small company or whether we're in a big company, to how can we, you know, what technologies do we need to have, what science do we need to have to actually minimize that failure rate while we're still in the laboratory. Just a brief aside, uh, as the, uh, the biotech industry, and I'm talking about that industry, that part of the drug industry that produces proteins and antibodies and non-small molecule types of drugs, as it has matured over the last 20 years, we're beginning to get reasonably solid data about relative success rates of uh, small chemical entities compared to the biological proteins. And a slight, maybe significant uh, uh, difference, that is that proteins are somewhat more successful. Obviously, we've got a lag time here, so we're looking back over the last 10 years till now. Proteins are slightly uh, more successful uh, in terms of their probability of success getting out to the market than small molecules if it's an unprecedented target. If it's a precedented target, a small molecule approach from the data to date uh, certainly wins out. Here's another interesting uh, statistic. I do some work for Booz Allen, who are a very large consulting company. I consult for consultants, which in itself is a little bizarre, especially when it comes to contract time. But um, what the folks at Booz Allen have begun to show, again with a good database, is that actually there's an inverse correlation between uh, spending growth and R&D productivity as uh, uh, measured by these indices. In other words, over the last decade, the companies that have piled more money quite deliberately and explicitly into R&D, they actually haven't had anything to show for it, at least in, the, in terms of the returns to date. And that may or may not play into the whole argument about uh, size and cost-effectiveness. There, there's a school of thought that says uh, if you're a GSK or a Pfizer, you're just too big. That school of thought feels that uh, about two to three hundred scientists is probably the, uh, the best size, is the optimal size of an, of, of an R&D operation. Frankly, you as a senior management okay, manager can stay closer on an individual level to that size of group, and that makes a, a heck of a difference. So R&D management has been working awfully hard in the last decade to look at various ways of increasing probability of success through the process, M much focus on decreasing development time, which has been unsuccessful to date. Uh, some of that is due to the FDA, some of that is due to the increasing complexity of uh, the disease processes that are being targeted, and therefore the design of clinical trials, and really managing risk by, by increasing the, the size of the portfolio of projects which you which actually have underway. These considerations are also very important for smaller biotech companies, especially this last one. You, we're always talking about how can we increase the shots on goal that we have. If you're a one-project company, it's a very binary situation. And it's easy to be very successful or you go down the tubes. Now, why has this stuff become so much harder seemingly over the last decade? Well, a lot of it has to do, obviously, and I won't dwell on this, with the increasing complexity of biology and the challenge in moving from an enormous amount of data here at the bottom to uh, you know, the generation of insights that will have r real meaning out there in medicine and that you can actually drug against. But I want to point out something that, that's not so well recognized, and it's a very positive feature. We are much more capable now of understanding 
uh, three-dimensional space in a large-scale way in terms of both uh, chemistry, I, the, the 3D space that small molecules and the diversity of small molecules uh, in a scale that encompasses billions and billions of molecules, uh, and how that molecular space relates to the three-dimensional characteristics of the target proteins or, or the target macro, macro, in fact, molecules that we're aiming at. Much of that has been driven by co-crystal structure analysis and our ability to uh, really take combinatorial chemistry in, in some very, very interesting ways, but mainly driven by uh, uh, the, uh, the power of chemi-informatics to understand this large space. And that is making, certainly in the small molecule drug discovery and development arena, a very big difference. You're running a large company, uh, or indeed a small biotech, you're always thinking, especially when it comes to budget time, how much money do I need to reinvest in my platform, in, in my technology platform? And if you're a big guy like GSK or Abbott or Pfizer, you, you've already committed to the big science approach to R&D. So you've already anted up uh, table stakes, and the issue is how much more do you need to put in? if anything at all. But there's a thesis out there that not too many people talk about that, or, or um, explicate in, in the way that this slide does. And that is, you actually need to invest in the critical mass of core technological capabilities to enable your investment in your projects to realize the kind of value that you want them to have. If you're subcritical in terms of your basic platform in research, then there's a, there, there is a greater chance that your projects are not, just not going to produce the same kind of value. And that's the fundamental consideration that underlies uh, the decisions about whether you should invest in yet another biotech company platform or not. And of course, these things are turning over all the time. Huge amount of data, as, as we've talked about, and, and especially challenging, but you know, very, very exciting to me is the vast increase in structural data. This slide is a few years out of date, and I think we could, we could easily compress uh, the time frame. Um, and of course, today, with the, uh, the, the beginnings, the glimmerings of the understanding that we have about the possible regulatory influence of the other 98% of the genome, which actually is not coding, the whole thing is getting infinitely more complex. However, on the bright side, we are getting the k kind of power in the informatics area that maybe it will enable us to keep pace. How, how do you actually manage this uh, in practice? Because uh, you know, all, all this kind of top level and big ticket stuff is really enough to give you a headache. What I found, and many other people have, is that it's uh, helpful to kind of think of your portfolio of stuff that you have and put it in three buckets. Uh, a portfolio of lead compounds that have come out of your screening and that are uh, some of which at least are worthwhile uh, putting into your preclinical and your early clinical development system. And then a portfolio of stuff that comes out of your clinical proof of concept uh, studies that are positive, that are ready to really be considered as real drug opportunities. And ideally, you want to have a luxury of choice at, at, at each of these transitions, you know, if you will, uh, over some time. And I have to tell you, I do not know of any pharmaceutical company, even the best run pharma, that actually has managed this so that they have a luxury of choice at each of these transitions. But that's the goal. As a head of research, you uh, try to you know, figure out how do I cope with all this basic science stuff and somehow have it translated with the forces that I have into a structure that needs to look forward clinically, not only clinically, but also commercially usually on a, on, a, on a disease target, a therapeutic area basis. And uh, structurally within discovery functions, that's not necessarily that easy to do. 
as you look at your portfolio of projects, um, you, you want to manage the risk in these projects on, a, on an individual project by project basis. Some projects you're willing to invest quite a lot in the preclinical research arena to establish a, 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 what I call here a really stringent profile, highly validated, that uh, in turn reduces the forward risk that you're carrying through into the clinic and vice versa. I found, and I think many other people have found, that it's, it's a lot easier to not only um, think this through in terms of how to make it work, but also in terms of how to be competitive with the Pfizer's and the others out there by bringing it down to the therapeutic or even the individual disease area level because these are more coherent and you can get a handle on uh, the kind of intellectual resource that you need to accumulate to be truly competitive spanning all these activities that I show here. And in fact, uh, what we call the disease area is probably at the best level actually of the overall hierarchy to really understand and even quantify what are the relationships between uh, the ultimate value of the project, the risk that you carry, and the level of investment that you make. And I'm not going to dwell on this, but this is some work and it's replicated in many drug companies uh, where you basically form a, 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 a kind of triangle of okay, opportunity uh, for your disease area where you have a number of molecular targets that the, uh, you know, are clearly of greater or lesser interest. Um, and these targets are, are aimed at preclinical profiles, what I call here research, research target profiles, that in turn one hopes to translate into competitive clinical profiles or the target product profiles. And you can map investment over time and uh, the cost and uh, do as best you can in evaluating the risk, which is the lack of translation, that, that this target will not translate to the biological effect or that the biological effect will not translate to the degree of clinical efficacy which you need. So that's a useful mapping process. And if you're really strategic, you can actually develop a kind of a 20-year outlook on that, which if you're in a big company wanting to invest strategically in a therapeutic area like cardiovascular or CNS, you actually need to do. We've talked about the economics of target validation. Uh, there's no way nowadays that even the largest drug company uh, with the portfolio that it needs to run can fully validate targets while uh, the compounds are still in the laboratory. So that has gotten into us all into the very fertile uh, and exciting area of validating targets actually in the clinic. Some people call it experimental medicine. And the FDA has allowed us tools, uh, phase zero, using very small doses you know, of drugs to uh, test some propositions. They could be pharmacokinetic propositions. They may be surrogate efficacy propositions. So clinical target validation is very important. Now, I ran a small molecule biotech company for a number of years in the early 2000s. Yeah, um, it was called 3D Pharmaceuticals. Why on earth would I do that? Um, the, the, you know, R&D of small molecules is the absolute heartland of the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, how, how could I compete, basically? That was the issue. Well, there are actually um, areas where the big companies can find uh, small okay, biotech companies focusing on small molecules, uh, quite an attractive proposition. You know, we heard from Bob the cytokinetics GSK story, and clearly cytokinetics came to that party with a, a, a particular nexus of expertise that was not all that readily available from within GSK. You know, and generally speaking, uh, if as a small company you, you have uh, special tools that enable you to de-risk targets that are sufficiently technically difficult that uh, a big company won't even consider on their portfolio because it just looks too hard and take, will take too long. Um, and I put up a couple of examples. Uh, uh, you know, constitutionally, the large farmers have found that, that, that serine protease inhibitors are actually not that easy. 
Uh, and the whole field of protein-protein interactions is, is still quite a stumbling block for everybody. If the small company has got a, a, you know, a particular uh, 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 insight into, into you know, could be, could be novel allosteric sites with, you know, IP around it, that can be very attractive. And we've seen examples, uh, companies, companies like Gilead and Vertex and others that admittedly it took them time over quite a number of years, really developed mastership uh, of in-depth structure function chemistry knowledge across a particular target family. Now, I uh, took on 3DP in Philadelphia uh, because I felt that, that, that we could be attractive to, you know, to large pharma on the basis of uh, the kind of platform that had been built over a period of five years before I joined the company as CEO essentially high throughput co-structure analysis, uh, extremely good chemi informatics and, in fact, CombiChem, uh, a, a, a very special proprietary screening tool that I'll show you with a totally integrated informatics support. I won't go through this history. Um, company founded in 1993 on the basis of uh, the tech platform that I've just described that we called DiscoverWorks. Um, that platform was especially suited for looking for inhibitors of, of some serine proteases. So we focused on things like thrombin, factor 10, urokinase, a number of others. Um, thrombin has, uh, had been a very difficult target, actually still is, for the pharmaceutical industry for the previous 25 years. Uh, the big companies had found it relatively easy to, you know, to get in vitro potency and selectivity, but they could not crack the bioavailability. Getting a good oral once a day non-prodrug thrombin inhibitor uh, proved an enormously difficult technical challenge. And we felt with our platform that we could really make a competitive effort there, which we did, and, and I'll show you a couple of slides on that. We took a compound into the clinic. I took the company public in 2000. It was a good time to do that. Did some strategic deals, both with Bristol Myers and also Johnson & Johnson. And finally sold the company to Johnson & Johnson uh, in the spring of 2003. And I'm happy to say J&J uh, &J and everybody else was, uh, it all turned out well. Let me just put it like that. A little bit more about the platform. Um, I'll talk very briefly about our thermodynamic high throughput screen that we had and the compilation of tools in the combinatorial and chemistry informatics, chemi informatics arena that we called you know, directed diversity. How we coupled that to uh, a lot of co-crystal structure analysis. And this was the, the schema, if you will, starting out with uh, some rather sophisticated tools that our informatics people had developed to enable us to, uh, uh, to look at gene sequence in, in 3D space and really understand in, in, in a pseudo 3D kind of way, to be fair, what the relationships between various members of large families of targets like kinases or GPCRs, et cetera, could actually be. Having chosen a target and expressed it, uh, we had a library of uh, roughly you know, half, half a million compounds, all derived from combinatorial chemistry precepts. So very easy to make and fundamentally important, very easy to further expand, as I'll show you. Um, this was our thermodynamic uh, okay, high throughput screen that was always our okay, initial screen that we used. I'll explain that in a bit more detail. And uh, the, we would, uh, you know, typically use libraries of several hundred compounds uh, th that from our informatics uh, platform we, we knew were uh, spread very, very diversely through chemistry space. We uh, had a point and click capability uh, so that we could actually get immediately know the structure of any of these dots in the 3D space universe. Quite cool. And um, we would make focus libraries after we discovered hits from 
what we call an, an, an accessible library of several billion analogs of our half million compounds that again were all synthesizable from the same combi chem principles and as diverse. So the virtual library was as diverse as the real library. And frankly, it was a snap for us to make a focused library of several hundred compounds for further screening. So we could go through this uh, synthesis, screening, resynthesis, SAR, uh, pretty quickly. Um, everything was IT controlled. And through that cycle and into the biological testing in pretty short order, many projects, especially our serine protease inhibitor projects, uh, as I say, we coupled that to a lot of structure-based drug design uh, based on doing hundreds of co-structures. In a bit more detail, we had a um, 15, 1536 well uh, platform for crystallization that we found immensely useful. Um, our cheminformatics, I've already talked about the virtual library that we had. It was uh, a, a, a very dense library from an informational point of view, not only four billion compounds, but we had hundreds of descriptors for each of these compounds. So after we screen the, what we call the first probe library, uh, we get the hits and we develop a view of what the next screening library, the focus library should look like. Uh, given the density of descriptors that we could have, we had the capability of what we called multi-objective selection. So we could co-select, if you will, not only for structural similarity, but also for ADMAT properties and even for cost of goods. And that in our thrombin program really helped us a lot. And in practice, there in the lab, the whole thing was supported by parallel synthesis. This is an example of uh, the kind of multi-objective property selection that we could do, uh, okay, making a selecting a focus library to be made. And in this particular instance, we, we wanted to constrain both the molecular weight and also the log P. And uh, it enabled us to make these selections on, on the basis of that kind of co-constraint very uh, quickly and readily. And this was all available to the individual scientists there on their laptop. So thermofluor is a thermodynamic assay. Um, it's based on the premise that if, you, if a small molecule ligand binds to a protein with an, with, with an affinity constant of 10 to the minus 6 molar, okay, a KD of 10 to the minus 6 molar or lower, then it's got to be meaningful, functionally significant. Um, so we could take a protein with this assay without knowing yet anything about its biochemistry and uh, screen it. And the way that we did that was to adapt 100-year-old uh, calorimetric technology uh, to modern high-throughput platform. Um, what we measured was the phase transition of a protein as a result of a stressor. The stressor that we used was heat. So we'd measure the Gibbs free energy uh, and express that as the melting temperature. And we had a set of proprietary dyes that selectively partitioned into, into the lipid phase of the melted protein and signaled as such. So our readout was an increase in fluorescence as the protein melted. Now, when a, um, and this, this is, uh, uh, in principle, this is uh, very old pharmacology and biochemistry. Uh, when a small molecule ligand binds to a protein, it stabilizes the protein. We kind of talked a little bit about this in regard to GPCRs earlier. And uh, when the small molecule binds to a protein, it shifts the melting curve of the protein. And the extent of the shift is correlated with the, um, I'm in fact, okay, affinity constant of the small molecule. At least that's what theory predicts. We had, a, we had a small but very good engineering group at 3D Pharmaceuticals who actually made the machines to, uh, to do this uh, thermodynamic screening with, and, and the hardest thing to do was actually have exquisitely thermally controlled 384 well plates. 
but we were able to do that. And our informatics allowed us to express the data uh, uh, very nicely in a visual sense. So a, 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 a right shift of the target protein melting curve would be expressed in various shades of red. Sometimes we did get a paradoxical left shift, which was blue. And uh, through pointing and clicking, you could actually uh, take a look at the raw data very readily and express it in different ways on your 384 well plate. Well, what's this got to do with real life? Um, we took our favorite project, Thrombin, and we correlated uh, the KAs that we obtained by this thermodynamic approach with uh, the KIs from you know, classical enzymology. And the correlation by and large was pretty good. It wasn't perfect, but it, but it was good enough for an initial screening approach to validate this platform as an initial screening approach. And these were uh, the banks of machines that we um, made and used. Um, we developed a 1536, well, okay, uh, um, in fact, version of this. We used, and I'm going to skip over this, Thermofloor, as, as you might figure, this kind of approach can be used for a variety of different other things, like looking at multiple in independent target okay, binding events, okay, allosteric, um, as well as active, active site binders. You can look for cooperativity. You can use it in a functional genomics mode. Very useful for secondary screening to look at the cooperativity of binding. Uh, determining whether the inhibitors are reversible or covalent, etc. Uh, many, many of the uh, okay, highly instructional slides that you saw from Bob, these experiments we could also do really pretty efficiently at the level of binding uh, using this assay. If you devised a, a particular library of compounds, you know, basic compounds that Okay, nucleotides, amino acids, sugars, cofactors, etc. You could uh, take an unknown gene product, unknown from a functional point of view, and uh, start a preliminary classification and what we call the decryption of that target. You could fingerprint kinases and illustrate that with a panel of several hundred, um, in fact, nucleosides and nucleotides, you could actually differentiate uh, fine features of kinases through this kind of a fingerprinting approach. Likewise, phosphorylated and non-phosphorylated states. And in the realm of protein-protein interaction, we actually had remarkable success. In a classic target, uh, the interaction of two proteins, HDM2 and P53, and beginning with the uh, published uh, P53 peptide structure, uh, we were able to use this thermofluor assay to f find some small molecules that at least had micromolar affinity for this particular pocket, and they're still being developed. So this sort of approach, what we called, since we're a little biotech company, we, you know, we need to have glitzy names for these things, and we called it chemigenomics. And it was really all about parallelizing uh, the capability of looking at a target before you understand all of its biology and biochemistry from the point of view of, is it actually druggable? Will small mo molecules interact with it with, with reasonably high affinity? Can these small molecules in turn be used as probes to examine the biology of the target and speed things up that way? That actually worked. Um, we had our thrombin project. Uh, we actually got to know from all of our structural work a lot about the, that particular family of serine proteases. Uh, we did maybe two or 300 co-crystal structures of our compounds with thrombin. And we um, rather straightforwardly found a compound that, uh, as the parent compound, had very high bioavailability in man as it had in animals, and pretty well straight line PKPD, uh, and it continues to be developed. So 3DP got sold to Johnson & Johnson. Um, and the reason 
for that, uh, the reason that J&J was looking to buy something, and this is a graph that you can see replicated in any major pharmaceutical company, is that as the um, strategic planners within the company forecast sales from the current pipeline, um, it didn't look so good, you know, in the out years. So there was a gap, something had to be brought in to fill the gap. And we were able to offer specifically to that company stuff that they didn't have. J&J Pharmaceutical Research Division, the core R&D group at J&J, are actually relatively small. And they spend relatively uh, lower percent of their total R&D budget actually on discovery research. And we were able to increment that very nicely for them. They were lacking a number of... Um, pretty important core activities like combinatorial chemistry, large-scale libraries. They didn't have any crystallography capability at all. We were able to give them that. And of course, we had these uh, chemi-informatics and thermodynamic screening tools that they liked a lot, as well as our pipeline. They, for a small company, obviously offered the financial resource to enable our scientists to feel fulfilled. Um, that the technologies and the projects that they had started were not going to be hindered by lack of capital in a much larger organization. And, you know, believe me, that was an important factor. If you're a scientist working in a little company and you know that, you're, that the company is financially constrained, it is, it is quite a downer when you realize that your bright ideas may not see the light of day because the company just doesn't have enough money. So let me wrap up. Um, I, as, as was said, I, uh, after selling 3DP to Jane J, um, I, you know, decided at least to step into the dark side, as we call it. You know, I moved from science to business and went over to money, sold my soul at least a little bit. Um, Red Abbey Venture Partners, small fund. Uh, its size allows us, uh, allows it us to consider really quite early investments in research that is ready to be translated out of academia uh, and, to, and to form companies. Um, I should parenthetically, by the way, say that, as I said at the outset, I've become really interested myself in arbitraging Indian R&D because there is a real window of opportunity there and, and I'm on the board of a company called Ad Venice for Advantage India US which has uh, a very nice business model of half of it being a contract research organization and making revenue, and that revenue is plowed back into their internal discovery and development operation. As venture capitalists, now wearing that hat, what we do is look for companies that are coming up to, if they're successful, a clear point where the, their value is going to increase. What we want out of this is return on our money. And the, and the bigger the return, the better. What the scientists and the little company want, of course, is the money so that they can progress their projects. So um, this is the kind of value, kind of accretion curve, that is you know, just typical for any project in the drug R&D arena. And as venture capitalists, you try to play through these value accretion points. So we have a portfolio of 20 companies. These are the folks. Uh, your very own Jonathan Karn is our scientific advisor, and a very important one. Um, and uh, we have a, a nice little portfolio. I'll point out two companies that I'm personally very close to uh, because I'm chairman of the board. One is Oxygen. It's a private company based in the UK. Um, it's got a, a humdinger of a of an antagonist, small molecule antagonist for a subtype of prostaglandin D2 receptor called CRTH2. And that receptor turns out to be the key player in the TH1, TH2 shift upstream of IL-4, IL-13, IL-5. This is going to be better than singular and probably as good as steroids, but safer. So uh, we're all looking forward to making a complete success of oxygen. And we do invest in some public companies, just to mention Cyclocell that, that uh, I also ch chair the board of, uh, CDK inhibitor company, couple of, uh, in fact, mid-stage 
uh, cancer trials in uh, solid tumors and also hem hematologic tumors. Um, I won't go through this, uh, having run out of time, but um, this is why India is very important and why I, over the last several years, have really gotten excited about India. Uh, it is an economic alternative to the troubles that I've outlined about the economic model of say, drug R&D, at least for a while it will be, as it moves from being a user uh, to a supplier to a true knowledge partner. And with that, I thank you very much. I think our comfort zone in the industry is if a screen, if, if uh, we get hits at the, um, you know, 0.05% level, something like that, maybe maybe to the 0.1% level. So one, one, in a, one in a thousand, more or less, is comfort zone nowadays. It used to be higher, that's where we are. Uh, because as the libraries have gotten bigger and the technology for real fast high throughput screening has gotten faster and more cost efficient, the, you can afford to push the stringency requirements up. But one in 10,000, um, it's a little stringent. So I think one of the things that's changing the economics is, of course, self-inflicted pain. And um, as the technology gets better, the criteria for acceptance gets higher and higher. And so I think you know, there's a tendency to underestimate uh, the contributing uh, impact of uh, combinatorial chemistry and understanding structural functions and so on. It's just that that comes from, that, that goes from the cutting edge technology to mm -hmm. uh, the going rate. Exactly. It keeps going up. You know, it, 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 these things become table stakes and, and you just gotta keep reinvesting. Uh, I would add to that, John, uh, sometimes, often enough, glitzy new technologies can be a real two-edged sword. You know, you are a little biotech company and you've got a fancy way of looking at the glycosylation patterns of protein and you think, this is a slam dunk. I'm gonna go out there and sell this to every bioprotein manufacturer out there. Nobody's interested because they don't wanna to have to put this in front of the regulatory agency and the regulatory agency is going to say, what a good idea. We will add this <laughs> set of criteria to, <laughs> uh, to everything that you need to do in order to get a novel protein product registered. Very careful with that. Yes? You talked about high throughput screening and structure-based drug design. What was the balance between the two in 3D pharmaceuticals? Oh, um, yeah. Uh, Yes. Um, we, 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 we actually tried to make the two, the, these things completely complementary. Uh, screening was first, um, you know, and, and we had this very slick way of getting into hit to lead via our large virtual library that uh, was all ComBiChem based so we could make focus libraries for the next round of screening very easily. Um, but we would, if the target itself was amenable, 
to, uh, you know, to structural insights, uh, given our 1536 well platform, if, if, if we knew we could crystallize it pretty readily, then uh, we would, you know, it was secondary, but we'd start getting into it quite early. And of course, economically, uh, protein, protein crystallography, I mean, 15 years ago, uh, you know, big companies like Smith, Klein, and Zeneca, we never got that right because it was always too late. Uh, whereas now it's, it's much less expensive. You can afford to kind of put it into your project earlier, make it, if not synchronous, have it as a very quick follow-up, which is what we like to do.